Well, for more on the Hyperloop, I also spoke to Josh Geigel, the CEO and co-founder of Virgin Hyperloop. I asked him about its vast potential and how it actually works. We are creating a new mode of transportation that's going to take you directly to your destination without stopping at every place along the way at the speed of an aircraft inside of a tube. So we do, uh, we use our own magnetic levitation, our own propulsion. We take most of the air out of the tube. It'd be like flying at about 50,000, uh, 50 kilometers of altitude. So that allows you to go to the speed of an aircraft for about 10 times less energy consumption. And so it's really allowing you to go when you want, where you want, at the speed of flight with much, much less uh, emissions. And obviously this is very welcome news. We're seeing a lot of more climate targets are being promised by a lot of different countries. So I know that'll be welcome news. Um, I want to talk about, I mean, really this is historical when it comes to, to transportation history. And um, we know that Virgin made history in November of 2020 with the first passengers to travel safely in the Hyperloop. Walk us through the journey that got you to that point and what this milestone actually means for the future of transportation. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. You know, starting the company in November of 2014, our goal was to show that Hyperloop could be a real mode of transportation. And to do that, we had to build the technology at our test site in Las Vegas. We had to show that it could work. And then we had to show that it needed to be safe. And so we did a lot of work over the last couple of years to work with an independent third party, verify that it was safe. And then it really culminated in our, what we call our Pegasus test. Our, our moment is really our man in the moon, man in the moon moments or, you know, kind of like Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier type of, of moment for us on November 8th of last year. And myself and one of my colleagues, Sara, who is our director of passenger experience, got into a Hyperloop for the first time. And we went down and actually uh, in our test facility, got up to speed, we got on, we got off, we showed the world that this is, this is safe. And that was kind of like uh, going to the top of the mountain. And now I want to say that I've ridden a Hyperloop and I want everybody else to ride one too. And the goal here is then to take that really two passenger vehicle and then move it to really a 28 passenger vehicle as part of the commercial system that we're developing. But it was all that that rooted, I'll say, foundational success that came from showing the world that a Hyperloop could be made safe. And over the last six months, the number of people who've asked me, can a Hyperloop be made safe is almost zero, which is really, really exciting because that means the test was successful. So for people who conjure up images, obviously the, the Simpsons episode with the, with the monorail didn't help, you know, when it comes to people sort of comparing the two. But what does the sensation actually feel like? Because since it's, it's not a plane and it's not a train, what does it actually feel like? Uh, I, I, do, I do very much know that Simpsons episode. And uh, I think the opportunity for us here is just to like reimagine the way that, that we move. It's taking the best of other modes. It's none of the worst. And it's actually using technology developed in this century over the last couple of years, as opposed to things that were developed 100 years ago. And you know, the, the example I like to give people is you wouldn't use a, a computer from 1980, right? And so we're using transportation systems from even decades before 1980. And so the goal for us is really to create a seamless experience. So when you get to a portal, which we call a station, we call a portal because it's about moving. It's not about being in, in stasis. And so you get there, you're not going to wait for hours like you would at an airport. You're going to wait for a minute or two, and then there's going to be a pod. In that pod, you'd walk in. There's about 25 other people. Once the doors close, the next time those doors open are at your final destination. So unlike a train, you're not stopping every place along the way. You're forming these convoys. Those convoys basically just peel off like cars on a road. And the sensation inside is very much like an aircraft that, uh, taking off feel a little bit of pushback in your seat. And once you're going, the beauty is that our control system, our autonomous control system, means there's not gonna be anything like turbulence. So you'll have a very smooth ride the whole time. You'll get to your end destination, you know, in a fraction of the time it would take for air. And then you'll get off and you'll be able to go on to your next day and tied into last mile solutions, whether they're autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, ride shares, or uh, EV tolls or VTOLs or whatever it might be, bikes, scooters, like, that can, can be a seamless experience from the moment you really think about going somewhere to the moment you get there. And travel really is a part of everything. It, it determines, you know, where we choose to go to school, where we choose to work. How do you see this? How do you envision this really changing everyday lives for people? I think this is probably the most exciting thing of, of, of all is that, you know, transportation is at the forefront of us as like a species, right? So, you know, civilization has moved forward as we've moved faster, right? So from Roman roads, Spanish ships, the railroad, the aircraft, 
every time we become more connected by being able to be connected faster, there's been a massive amount of growth that followed. And so some of the examples I like to give people are, imagine being able to go from New York to Washington, D.C. faster than you can get across uptown Manhattan. So you start to change this dynamic of where, what is accessible to you and what is, I'll say, uh, nearby. What is, what is your neighborhood? Now your neighborhood becomes a couple of hundred miles or a hundred kilometers. And that's just a foundational shift because now I can have like the best cancer center in the world in one location and still have access to, to it from the entire country or wherever you might be. And you're able to have, you know, the best schools or, or specialized schools where you can attract the best talent, but still have people go home each and every night and be with their family. And I think that's, you know, the COVID situation has really, I'll say, re reinforced the things that matter, which is that human connection with people. And I think what we're doing is we're doing that for the way that we want to live this century and the next century, but also in a way that's not destroying the environment around us.